Hey everyone, this lesson is on reactive arthritis and we'll also talk about Reiter's syndrome in this lesson. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about what causes these conditions, some of the pathophysiology behind why they occur. We're also gonna talk about the signs and symptoms, how they're diagnosed and how they're treated. So first let's talk about what reactive arthritis is. Reactive arthritis is arthritis, which is joint inflammation that occurs following a bacterial infection. So it's very key, it occurs after a bacterial infection has occurred. So oftentimes when looking at the joint itself, although it's inflamed, it is sterile. It is a sterile synovitis, which means that there's not bacteria infecting the joint itself. It is a process that has occurred after some other bacterial infection that has occurred in another part of the body. It is one of the seronegative spondyloarthropathies as well. And it may progress to a condition known as Reiter's syndrome. We're going to talk more in detail about Reiter's syndrome later on in this lesson. Now, reactive arthritis occurs one to three weeks after initial infection. So when a patient has been infected with particular bacteria, we're going to talk about those in the next slide. But when they have had an infection in one location in their body, one to three weeks later, they can have this type of arthritis. What is the epidemiology of this condition? It is estimated to affect up to 27 in 100,000 people. And males outnumber females with this condition as they do with other seronegative spondylar arthropathies. And it's more likely to occur in the second to third decade of life. And it has an association with HLA B27. So patients who have HLA B27 are more likely to have this condition and other types of seronegative spondyloarthropathies as well. And this association is very significant in that 30 to 50% of patients who have reactive arthritis actually have HLA B27. So again, very important to note here. Let's talk about some of the causes and some of the pathophysiology behind this condition. Some of these bacteria include streptococcus. So having a streptococcal infection can lead to reactive arthritis occurring after the infection has resolved. Another bacterial infection that can lead to reactive arthritis is an infection with chlamydia trachomatis. So this is very important. Chlamydia is a sexually transmitted disease. So patients who have chlamydia can progress to having reactive arthritis. Other bacterial causes include Seminella, Shigella, and Campylobacter, and even Yersinia or Yersinia pestis. Now, the pathophysiology behind this condition is as follows. It is an immune-mediated condition. So because it is associated with HLA-B27, we shouldn't be surprised that it has to do with the immune system. It is immune-mediated. And why this occurs is because immune cells, or T lymphocytes more specifically, become activated by bacterial fragments. So fragments of these bacteria we just mentioned activate T lymphocytes. And these T lymphocytes mistakenly attack components of certain joints. So they become activated and then they think that parts of joints are actually bacteria that they need to attack. And this can lead to arthritis or inflammation of that particular joint. So although there's no bacteria in the joint, the T lymphocytes think that the parts of the joint are bacteria that they need to attack. So this is why reactive arthritis occurs. So now that we know some of the causes and the pathophysiology behind this condition, what are some of the signs and symptoms of reactive arthritis? So as we see in its name, arthritis occurs. So inflammation of a joint occurs. Oftentimes it is a sudden onset. So sudden onset of arthritis in a joint. Usually the arthritis lasts for a particularly long period of time, at least one month in duration. And what is noted is that the arthritis is asymmetric. So it's on one side of the body and not on both sides of the body. And what is important to note with reactive arthritis is that the knee is the most common joint that is affected. But having said that, other joints may be affected as well. And these include the axial spine. So the spine itself can be affected. This occurs in 10% of cases. Sacroiliitis is another joint that can be affected in this condition. So where the sacrum meets the ilium, of the pelvis, this can also be affected as well. Again, it's unilateral, one-sided, and some small joints can also be affected. And we most often see this in the lower extremities. So small joints in the lower extremities are more likely to be affected than small joints in the upper extremities. Now there are some other key important features 
with regards to reactive arthritis disease include constitutional symptoms. And when we say constitutional symptoms, we typically refer to fatigue and fever and those types of symptoms. And then we can also see Reiter's syndrome occurring as well. So reactive arthritis can progress to a Reiter's syndrome. And Reiter's syndrome is a triad of arthritis. So that reactive arthritis we just talked about, but also a couple of other findings. Conjunctivitis, so inflammation of the conjunctiva of the eyes, and urethritis. So urethritis is inflammation of the urethra, so burning sensation when urinating. So this is the triad of Reiter syndrome. So if you see these three, very, very suggestive of Reiter syndrome. So some more specific symptoms include a dysuria, so burning sensation when urinating, prostatitis, so inflammation of the prostate gland, and cervicitis, or inflammation of the cervix. So this can occur with some sexually transmitted diseases as well. And there is a mnemonic that is used to remember the signs and symptoms of Reiter syndrome. This mnemonic is the phrase, can't see, can't pee, can't climb a tree. So can't see because of the conjunctivitis, can't pee because of the burning sensation when urinating, and can't climb a tree because of the arthritis. And if there's two out of the three, we refer to this as incomplete Reiter syndrome. Now, another finding that can occur in patients with reactive arthritis includes what is known as keratoderma blenorragicum. So this is what it looks like. And it occurs most commonly on the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. So it looks like this. This is keratoderma blenorragicum. And some other signs and symptoms of reactive arthritis include oral ulcers, diarrhea, tendonitis, and plantar fasciitis. So it can be a wide variety of signs and symptoms that can occur in reactive arthritis. But what we're going to see more specifically is a bacterial infection that has occurred at some point in the past one to three weeks, sudden onset of arthritis. And if Reiter syndrome is occurring, we can see these other signs and symptoms. And then we can also see some of these other vague, nonspecific signs and symptoms as well. Now, how is this condition diagnosed and treated? So diagnosis of reactive arthritis is a clinical diagnosis by history, by physical examination. The clinician oftentimes can make the diagnosis. Blood culture, stool culture, and cervical swab can also be helpful in determining an associated infection. So if there is another infection, one of those bacteria we talked about, for instance, this can also aid in the diagnosis. What can also be found is sterile pyuria. So this is pus in the urine, but there's no bacteria. So white blood cells in the urine, but no bacteria. And with all of these, with the blood culture, stool culture, cervical swab, it's important to assess for an infective cause. And then in some cases, HLA-B27 can be assessed to see if a patient is positive with this. As we mentioned before, it's very associated with reactive arthritis. Once a clinician has made the diagnosis, how do they treat this condition? Oftentimes, this condition resolves spontaneously on its own. So a lot of times, treatment is supportive. It resolves oftentimes, usually within six months. So it can take a long time. And it may wax and wane. So it may appear to be getting better. And then it gets worse and it gets better and so on. It's also important to treat the underlying infection if applicable. So if there is an underlying infection that is still infecting the patient, it's important to treat that infection. Some infections may have already resolved and there's no infection to treat. So antibiotics would be used in a case where there is a current infection. And then non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs are important to use for pain control. And then some other supportive therapies for reactive arthritis include exercise, steroid injection, and physical therapy. So again, this condition can resolve spontaneously on its own. So treatment is oftentimes supportive, but it can last for months and months. So a lot of times these other types of therapies, including exercise and physical therapy, are important to help improve functioning of the affected joint. So if you want to learn more about other rheumatological conditions, please check out my rheumatology playlist. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.